Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Agent. Welcome to our video. All right. Hello, I am Janine Cullen, a Virginia Master Gardener, and most recently I completed training to be a climate reality leader. Uh, the Climate Reality Project is a nonprofit started by former Vice President Al Gore in 2011. It has over 21,000 members and branches in over 150 countries. So my range is talking to three uh, main areas, uh, global impacts of climate change, the impacts to the United States, and then so it's not all gloom and doom, uh, what, what we can do. And just a footnote, uh, the charts that I pulled from for this presentation were from this summer, so it, it won't have um, a lot of the information from the, from the hurricanes we've had this late summer, fall, and then the, the fires out west. Um, I will mention them, but you won't see charts on them. So just kind of a little refresher about what is climate change and, and what are greenhouse gases. So the sun releases energy primarily in three forms. In ultraviolet energy, which is responsible for our sunburns and skin cancer, uh, visible energy, which is light, and then infrared energy, which is heat. Most of our, the radiation from the sun is blocked by our atmosphere. It's reflected by our atmosphere, the thin blue line in this um, picture. So you can think of our atmosphere as like a shield and a blanket. A shield because it reflects about half the energy from the sun, and a blanket because it keeps the Earth's temperature uh, relatively stable, uh, certainly in compared to the other uh, planets in our solar system. Some of the heat energy that hits the surface of the Earth is reflected back up into space. But our atmosphere, our thin atmosphere, catches a small part of that heat and then brings it back down to the Earth. And so that's the blanket effect of our atmosphere. So again, it keeps the Earth's temperature relatively stable. The problem is, and you saw that thin atmosphere get a lot thicker, when we have a lot of greenhouse gases in the air in our atmosphere, and greenhouse gases are primarily carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. We have all those greenhouse gases, the, our atmosphere gets thicker, and more of that heat gets captured, gets caught in our atmosphere and comes back down to the earth, causing the entire globe on average to heat up. So NASA has documented that the average global temperature on earth has increased by a little more than one degree Celsius, which is about uh, 1.8 degree Fahrenheit since 1880. So 1.8 degree Fahrenheit um, may not seem like a lot. You can't feel that when you go outside, but that's a global average. So some places on earth are 21 degrees hotter and others are 20 degrees cooler. So it's that, that big temperature variation which is causing global climate chaos and a lot of chaos in our weather patterns. And then I'll show you some of that. Here's the global impacts of climate change. Our atmosphere is getting thicker because humans are spewing 152 million tons of man-made pollution in the atmosphere every day. Here's some of the main sources of pollution. Uh, burning forest, transportation industry, factory farming of animals, and industry. However, the absolute number one largest source of pollution in our atmosphere is the burning of fossil fuels. So starting about World War II, 1939, our reliance on fossil fuels started going up dramatically. That's when countries around the world started building large fossil fuel plants particularly coal burning plants, and in their cities to produce energy for factories, automobiles, and industry. As a result, global temperatures are going up very fast. And scientists are telling us that this year, 2020, already has more than a 70% chance of being the hottest year ever measured. Nineteen of the twenty hottest years have been since two thousand and one, and the five hottest years have been the last five years. Europe had the hottest year ever recorded last year, 
and all of these countries, France, Germany, Netherlands, UK, Belgium, and Luxembourg, all broke their all-time high record in 2019. Canberra, the capital of Australia, they just set an all-time high record in January of this year, 111 degrees. In Antarctica with the penguins, they set a new record of 69 degrees Fahrenheit in February of this year. In Siberia in June of this year, it went above 100 degrees, the hottest temperature ever measured north of the Arctic Circle. So land masses can reflect uh, some of the heat, like in the summertime when you look across the, a road, you can see some of that heat uh, reflecting back up. But water, it absorbs heat. It's, it's like a heat sink. So 93% of the extra heat in the atmosphere gets absorbed into our ocean. And this is significant for fish and other aquatic animals. And it also leads to algae blooms around the world. Um, which is also ruins the environment for fish and is dangerous to humans. Similar to the chart uh, showing the temperature increase on land, this chart shows the temperature increase in our oceans. Ocean temperatures hit a new record last year and most certainly will again this year. This is the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, one of the great wonders of the world. I was fortunate to visit and to swim in the Great Barrier Reef in, in 2005, but it did not look like this. The coral cannot survive the higher ocean temperatures and they die off, uh, making it turn white and, and look ghost-like. Uh, we have lost 30% of the Great Barrier Reef just in the past four years. As the temperature increase in the atmosphere and in the ocean, it magnifies the amount of water vapor coming off the oceans and going into the sky. So warmer air can carry a lot more water. So from your middle school science class, here's the water cycle. So water evaporates over the ocean, moves over land coming down in precipitation, either rain or snow comes down to the land and runs through our rivers and streams and back out to the ocean. But when you have a lot more water vapor coming off the oceans into the air, moving over land, creating more precipitation in rain or snow, then you have a much higher probability of floods and mudslides. I was on vacation in Italy in 2015. I was standing right here where this gentleman is in St. Mark's Square. And it most certainly did not look like this. St. Mark's Basilica has flooded only six times in the past 1,200 years. But four of the six floods have been in the last 20 years. This was England earlier this year. Three major storms in a row with heavy downpours. You can see the area is just saturated. Additional water vapor adds intensity and fuel to typhoons, hurricanes, um, and cyclones. This typhoon came ashore in May of this year as a Category 3 in the Philippines. It brought strong winds, heavy rains, and damaging storm surge that destroyed over 1,000 homes. This happened in Norway just earlier this year after torrential downpours. This is an area that, that people have called home for many generations. This land is just sliding into the Norwegian Sea. All of these homes and properties are all, all lost. So those were pretty specific examples, but here's kind of the summary data. Global floods and extreme rainfall events are happening four times more frequently than they were just 40 years ago. 
The same extra heat that creates extra evaporation from the oceans and causes excessive rain and, and floods on land also causes evaporation from the soil by sucking moisture out of the topsoil. So it creates droughts that take place more often. The risk of drought definitely increases as temperature rise. This is a dry lake bed in the sixth largest city in India just last year. They're just out of water. This year, the Czech Republic had the worst drought it's had in 500 years. Parts of Poland, the worst in 100 years. Due to increasing global temperatures, NASA estimates of the ice lost in Greenland is four times faster than they originally thought. You can see the ice loss in gigatons just since 2002. The ice melting in Antarctica has accelerated dramatically. And when this massive amount of ice in Greenland and Antarctica, sea levels around the world rise. Sea levels contribute to some of the flooding you saw earlier, and we'll, we'll see some examples again. Another feature of climate change is increase for lightning strikes. This is a factor in quite a few fire, forest fires. For every degree that the temperature gets warmer, there is more than 10% 10, 10 increase in lightning strikes. Here's a fire in Greenland. We don't normally think about the possibility of forest fires there. Temperatures were warmer and the ice melted earlier. There was some vegetation, but the vegetation dried up in the hot weather. And then they had a lightning strike. The Prime Minister of Greenland pointed directly to climate change as the reason for increased fires in Southern Europe. This is Australia last year, and we all saw the horrible photos of the fires this year with the koala bears on fire. Last year, uh, Australia said 2019 was the hottest and driest year on record. I suspect they'll, they'll modify that for uh, 2020. So putting all these climate disasters together, extreme temperature, droughts, fires, floods, and storms, you can definitely see a trend over the years. And this chart is from the insurance industry. And they are pointing out that these climate related disasters are completely unsustainable. They cannot keep paying out for climate related disasters. So soon it's gonna start costing all of us a lot more to insure ourselves, our homes, our businesses, and our communities. As a master gardener, this is one of the most troubling slides to me. This is tree cover loss just in 2019. Um, th and these are fires, people burning down the forest intentionally to create fields for cattle farming or fields for crop. A and this is a double hit because you not only get the extra pollution in the air from the forest fires, but you're, you, get, you destroy uh, the best thing nature has created to, to pull carbon dioxide out of the air, and that's a tree. So this is a, a double hit to the environment. So this is the drivers of tree loss cover around the world. And uh, something I did not know until I started doing some research for this presentation. You hear, see here in Southeast Asia, uh, the primary driver is commodity driven deforestation. So they burn the forest and then they plant acres of palm oil. And I did not know that palm oil is the most produced plant oil. Palm oil is primarily found in processed goods. They say that 50% of the packaged goods in grocery store contain palm oil. It's also in some uh, cosmetics and, and body, body creams. But we as consumers can play a role in reducing this destruction by, by looking at the ingredients uh, when we buy packaged goods from the store. So if it contains palm oil, just, just don't buy it. Of course, we know that the Amazon forest is, is constantly under assault. Uh, we've heard it called the lungs of the world. Unfortunately, the current rate of destruction is about one football field per minute. So we've been talking about 20 minutes or so. 
So we've lost 20 football fields of the Amazon rainforest. This is satellite images of all the, the fires in South America. And these are intentionally set fires um, to clear the forest. And right through here is the Amazon rainforest. So here's the impacts to the United States, and I'll kind of go through the, the same sequence just uh, pretty quickly. So just a few months ago, we recorded the hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth right here in the USA. Death Valley, California, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And that park ranger must be incredibly hot standing out there in his gear. This is Miami, Florida, and yes, that is a live octopus in the parking garage. Much of Miami is at sea level, so the flooding that invites sea creatures to come in from the sea is at an increased rainfall because of the warmer temperatures of the oceans and the increased sea level rise due to the melting ice in Greenland and Antarctic, the charts I showed earlier. This is a historic Ellicott City in 2018. This was supposed to be one of those once in a thousand year downpours, but it also happened in 2016. Ellicott City is in a valley, so there are mountains and hills all around. So this is a result of not only a torrential storm, but a very bad environmental impact assessments. There's been a lot of new development around Ellicott City. So farmland and old growth forests uh, have been destroyed and replaced with uh, impervious surfaces like roads, houses, shopping centers with hundreds of parking places. So normally when it rains, old growth forests are, are like a sponge, they, they soak up the water. But when it rains on impervious surfaces, it runs right off and follows gravity downhill. And in this situation, unfortunately, downhill was Ellicott City. Hurricane Florence produced a record-breaking rainfall across North and South Carolina in September 2018. This was uh, last year in New Orleans. Uh, most of New Orleans is at or even below sea level, so when they get heavy downpours, they get a lot of flooding, and the flooding events have been increasing. There's a downpour in Washington, D.C., and it was notable uh, because how wide and how intense the storm was. Frederick, Maryland received over six inches of rain and Reagan National Airport got over three inches from the same storm in under two hours. Coastal cities like Norfolk, Virginia are experiencing double high tide flooding events just in the past 30 years. In the northern part of the United States, uh, rivers are overflowing their banks more frequently due to extreme downpours. This is the Red River between North and South, North Dakota and Minnesota um, with normal water levels. And then on 17 April of this year, after a lengthy downpour, it overran its banks and uh, damaged a, a lot of property. Farmers were really hurt the last year in the prime farmland of our Midwest. 20 million acres could not be farmed because of the massive downpours in 2019. There was 20 billion in damages in 2019, and much of that is paid by taxpayers in the form of bailouts and uh, federal crop insurance. So taxpayers are having to pay for the, the uh, impacts of climate change. Two thousand and nineteen was the wettest year ever recorded in the Midwest and the second wettest in the United States as a whole. This is a hazardous chemical company underwater in Michigan earlier this year. So remember the slides I showed about uh, the melting ice in Greenland and Antarctica. Well, that contributes to sea level rise uh, around the world. So this is the top 10 cities by asset, so dollar value um, at risk due to sea level rise. And number one is Miami, Florida. And number three is the New York area. A 
a large part of New York is now considered part of be in the flood zone due to the sea level rise happening around the world. So let's move on to fires. This was 2019 and California stated last year that that was their worst year for fires. And I, I'm sure they will revise that for, for 2020. Already this year in California, over 4 million acres have been burned. And that's about 4% of the state. This was in Arizona in June this year. So the, the fires out west this year have just, just been devastating. When you see high temperatures and drought, you, you also see more fires. So there is a direct correlation. And just one additional fact about greenhouse gases. Um, besides carbon dioxide, uh, coal burning power plants emit uh, mercury vapor into the air. 42% of all the mercury pollution going into the air in the United States comes from burning coal. Mercury vapor impacts our immune system, our lungs, and our kidneys. And just last month, the EPA relaxed mercury pollution requirements for coal power plants, saying it was too costly for the power plants to comply. So we are going backwards in air pollution regulations in the United States. So if you don't believe the environmental impacts of uh, climate change, you must believe the economic impacts. So for the fourth year in a row, the International Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland has designated climate change as the number one threat to the global economy and certainly to the US economy. So I promised it wouldn't be all gloom and doom. So here's some things that are happening, some positive things and some things that we can do. In 2015, over 200 company, countries came together and committed to work together to slash emissions and solve the climate crisis through the historic Paris Agreement. The goal is to keep global average temperature rise to below two degrees Celsius while working very hard to hold it under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, nearly two years after the Paris Agreement was signed, Donald Trump that he announced that he would take the United States out of the Paris Agreement. But just how the, the, the agreement was written, the earliest he could take us out is, uh, ironically, um, for November this year, the day after the presidential election. So Donald Trump will still be president on for November, no matter who, um, no matter what the election results. So I suspect he will sign the paperwork to take us out. Uh, however, um, Al Gore holds periodic uh, town halls with climate reality leaders. And there is an agreement in place that if there were to be a new president elected um, 3 November this year, that come January 2021, we could sign some paperwork uh, to request to get be put back into the, the Paris Agreement. In response to President Trump's decision to withdraw the U.S. from the Paris Agreement, 24 states joined together to create the United States Climate Alliance and very happy to see Virginia and Maryland um, on this list. Their goal is to help the United States still meet its Paris agreements while doing what they can within their state. And, and they are succeeding. The federal government has actually put up roadblocks by uh, relaxing some rules on pollution over the past four years. But these, four, these states are meeting the, the Paris Accord Agreement. So I give a lot of credit to all the, all the governors of all these states. And we do have some solutions. We start focusing more on renewable energy. 20 years ago, the best projection for wind energy were that by the year 2010, we could reach 30 gigawatts of wind energy. Instead, in 2010, we reached 200 gigawatts, overshooting projections by over 660%. Recently, we beat it 22 times over with global wind capacity reaching almost 650 gigawatts in 2019. Global wind energy capacity is surging and expected to continue growing. There's a lot of uh, private investment in wind energy. 
Just some examples of how it can be done with support of your country's leadership. Uh, Germany has been investing heavily in wind and solar. And in the first half of this year, more than half of all Germany's electricity came from renewables. Last year, the United Kingdom got 18 times as much electricity from renewables as from coal. Uh, England is the birthplace for burning coal. I used to live in England years ago, and there was a coal fireplace in every single home. So this is uh, rather remarkable. The increase in solar power has been even more dramatic than wind power. The best estimate 18 years ago were that the amount of solar energy we could install each year might reach one gigawatt per year by 2010. Well, we beat that mark in 2010 17 times over. And last year, we beat that mark 121 times over with well over 100 gigawatts. The solar power curve is even steeper than the one for wind energy and rising even faster. And here's the main reason for the rise in solar energy. The cost continues to come down dramatically. So we went from $80 a watt in 1976 all the way down to 20 cents a watt just this year. Chile decided to move away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. They went from 0% in 2013 to over 10% of the energy needs coming from renewable energy in 2018. The Chilean government has reached an agreement with their electric companies to phase out coal units completely by 2040. In California, on some days, they can get almost three quarters of their electricity from renewables. Here you can see the trend lines and the uh, transition to re renewables. We, we all know it's about the cost. People say they want to do the right thing for the environment, but if it costs them money, they, they're probably not going to do it. Six years ago, electricity from solar and wind power was cheaper than electricity from fossil fuels just in 1% of the world. Five years later, just last year, it was cheaper than fossil fuels in two thirds of the world. And four years from now, they predict in 2040, 20, I'm sorry, 2024, renewable energy will be cheaper than fossil fuels in 100% of the world. And we're not gonna run out of solar energy. We get as much energy from the sun in one hour that would supply all the electricity the world needs for a full year. Of course, it's a matter of capture, storage, and distribution, but we are working on that. There are new storage technologies being developed which are going to make solar and wind even more useful. A lot of research and development investment going on for energy storage devices. New investment in U.S. in clean energy keeps going up. This is um, all private, state, and local investment since uh, there is no investment currently from the federal government. Uh, last year investments were at all-time record. And this year, they may even go higher, even though we're in the middle of a pandemic. The reduced cost of renewable is creating a, a business case for power companies to move away from fossil fuels. In California, GE announced that it's going to demolish this huge uh, natural gas fired power plant years ahead of schedule because it cannot compete with solar and wind. They're going to increase their investment in clean energy renewables. This is a commuter traffic in Los Angeles. I used to sit in that traffic for many years. In the United States, power plants were the largest source of pollution for many years. But in 2017, the transportation sector took over as a leading course of leading cause of um, carbon dioxide. This is our cars and our trucks and our buses. But things are starting to change uh, with consumers buying electric vehicles. Electric vehicle adoption is skyrocketing, skyrocketing with global sales growing 46% in 2019. Many auto manufacturers are making a shift to electric vehicle, and I'm happy to see some U.S. companies on this list.
a lot of countries are actually passing laws that will phase out internal combustion engines. They will not even sell fossil fuel cars. And I heard just this year that uh, California is considering this also. Half of the buses uh, around the world are gonna be electric within five years. Of course, most of these are coming from China, which they have made a commitment to 100% electric buses. So let's talk about jobs. Over the past five years, the jobs in the solar energy in the United States have grown five times faster than job growth in the overall economy. So globally, more than 10 million people work directly in the renewable energy sector. So this is a jobs creating sector of the economy. Solar installer is projected to be the fastest growing job in the United States through to 2028 with the wind turbine service technician coming in second. Already there are five times as many jobs here in the United States in solar as there are in coal mining. But we as a country need to make a commitment for job training for all the Americans that work in the fossil fuel industry. Most people working in the coal mines today are electricians, uh, machinists, equip machine equipment operators, plumbers, and, and computer operators. Well, all industry needs those job skills, so we need to help them transition to renewable energy jobs. So I, I think the world is on the verge of a, a major shift. We're seeing marches and demonstrations and demands at the ballot box for the changes necessary to solve this climate crisis. And as Americans are coming more educated and more aware of the damage to our earth due to unchecked use of fossil fuels, they're demanding a change from our government. And what's really inspiring to me is the younger generation. And I give full credit for this to all the science teachers all around the United States. Oop, go back. Um, go back. Uh, they are being honest with their students and using facts to uh, let them know about the damage that the prior generations have created to the environment due to their dependence on burning fossil fuels. So these students are demanding a better world for themselves. All right, now, what you can do locally. Uh, the biggest thing you can do is vote on or before 3 November. Uh, vote for someone that understands science. Vote for someone that believes facts. And vote for someone that cares about the long-term future of America. Second, use your voice to get to know your local officials. Are they voting on a new industry in your neighborhood that may cause additional pollution? Are they voting to pay, pave over forest for more roads and shopping centers that may cause flooding in your community? And number three, use your choices. For your next car, can you consider an electric vehicle? Can you new, use renewable energy at your house? And then my favorite is plant trees. The, the best uh, invention ever created to pull carbon dioxide out of the air has been on this planet for millions of years, and it's a tree. So plant a native tree in your yard and, and talk to your community about planting more native trees in your neighborhood. And do what you can to get some of the carbon dioxide out of the environment. And lastly, speak up and speak truth to power like your world depends on it. Because it absolutely does. Uh, this picture is called the blue marble and it's one of the most widely distributed images in existence. It was taken uh, during the Apollo mission the last Apollo mission, Apollo 17, on December 7th, 1972. And what makes the photograph so unique and powerful is it's the first time the entire globe was captured in one photo. And I like it because it reminds us that we all share the same Earth. Uh, what happens in, in Asia affects the United States, and what happens in the United States affects Europe. We all need to work together to save our home. And like the, the wise t-shirt says, there is no planet B. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. Um, if you'd like more information on the Climate Reality Project, here is their website. And thank you for the Master Gardeners for, for hosting this uh, talk. Uh, even though we had some te technical difficulties, I'll put it up on their YouTube channel. So if you have any questions about the environment or about plants or trees, certainly uh, contact the Master Gardeners. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing and end this.